Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our time is up. And I must say one more time that you are all welcome to the second edition of the Ghana Finance and Investment Summit 2020. We had the first edition in 2019 at the British Council last year. Yesterday, we had a good time. It was an incredibly insightful session we had yesterday. We happened to be the first session for the second edition of the Finance and Investment Summit 2020, organized by the CGI Network Ghana under the auspices of the CGI Institute, which happens to be the parent body headquartered in New York. Um, I will tell you a brief about it. My name is Gipti Boatma Anan. I'm just a Habenja, a forerunner, who will soon hand over to the moderator for the session. But before I do so, I will tell you a brief about the parent body, which is the CGI Institute. The CGI Institute is a globally recognized professional body of finance and investment professionals who are committed to certain global standards for ethical investment practices. The Institute provides the Chartered Global Investment Analyst designation, which is a gateway, indeed, as a gateway to a global network of finance and investment professionals all around the world. The program, which happens to be the CGI, will help you gain demonstrated expertise, credibility, and a well-rounded knowledge that can be immediately transferred or translated to business activities and client-facing advisory functions. Um, if you please allow, I would crave your indulgence. I'll be showing you in brief a video about the CGI so that you totally understand what the CGI is all about. Looking for a globally recognized certification which will give you a career advantage? Then this is your opportunity to make that happen with the CGIA. The Chartered Global Investment Analyst is the world's largest and recognized professional body providing approved designation for the investment and financial services industry. With a network of over 10,000 members across Americas, Europe, Africa, Middle East and Asia, and affiliations with over 300 institutions worldwide. The CGIA designation gives you the global edge. CGIA will help you to gain deep knowledge, demonstrated expertise and credibility in the investment and financial services industry. With CGIA Charter designation, you will be recognized in over 100 countries worldwide and help you to distinguish yourself with knowledge, expertise, and a clear career advantage over industry peers. Join the world's leading professional body for the financial services industry today. Join the CGIA now. CGIA. Limitless possibilities. www.cgiaglobal.com Okay, and so there you had it. Everything you need to know about the CGI was on that video, okay? <clears throat> so if you really want a clear career advantage of our industry peers, then the CGI presents to you a lifetime opportunity to become a globally recognized investment and finance professional. All you have to do is to visit the website, www.cgiinstitute.org and every piece of information you need is beautifully scripted on there. If there's anything you do not understand, um, there will be numbers over there you could call. We would be readily available to assist you any day, any time on whatever you need. Okay, now let me one more time welcome you to the main reason why we are here today. Just like I said yesterday, we had an incredibly insightful session with our first panel, and it was great. We actually navigated the vortex of the COVID-19, and we were taught how to become opportunists in moments like this. But today we are taking it a step further. I must say that it is obvious that COVID-19 pandemic has presented to the entire human race um, an almost unprecedented challenge to everybody, to us as individuals, to us as organizations, to cities, to families, to nations, continents, 
Talk about the entire world, irrespective of the sector you find yourself in. None have been able to escape the venom of the pandemic. But in all these, one thing has become increasingly clear, that technology is inevitable. Um, it actually proven that life without technology is pointless in today's dynamic world. Hence, our topic for discussion for this session, which is leveraging on technology in critical moments. Ladies and gentlemen, sit up top as I introduce to us our moderator for this session in the person of Patrick Baum. Enjoy the session. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Bahabangwa, as rightly introduced. And I'll be your moderator for our panel to discussion. As you are all aware, investing in innovation. Run through the profile of our speakers before we start the discussion. So I will start with uh, Gary Whitehill. So he is chosen by the economists in 2019 as one of Africa's foremost leadership advisors. Gary leads the geopol geopolitical foresight practice for Africa's premier strategy advisory agency directing digital, economic, physical, and social infrastructure investment to empower continental self-reliance. In 2017, he partnered with the Vatican and former Archbishop of Cape Coast, Cardinal P Peter Texin, to launch the Laudato Sea Challenge, which was blessed by Pope Francis and targeted courses mentioned in the 2015 Encyclica. Widely regarded as the leading authority on building African resilience in the 21st century, Gary's current clients include multilateral agriculture, finance and energy institutions, government and multinational corporations across sub-Saharan Africa. Gary has been featured in media outlets worldwide, including CTFM's uh, Ghana CTFM Channel TV, Entrepreneur Magazine, Harvard Business Review, The New York Times, and This Day Nigeria. You are welcome, Gary. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Our next speaker is uh, Ashley Thompson McCarty. Uh, Ashley is the CEO and the head of currencies and commodities as Obsidian Alchana. I hope I got the name right. <laughs> He's well vested in financial analysis, investment banking, portfolio management, economics, and has also acquired vast experience on the FX markets. Ashley's achievements have been remarkable over the existence of the Obsidian Alchana Limited. He has led the team to execute some outstanding trades. Which have, which have placed Obsidian among the top brokerage firms in Ghana. Proud to joining Obsidian, he began his finance career at a Middle East multifamily, multifamily office where he executed sell aside and buy aside trades on the futures commodity market. He later became a senior partner at Reflex Echo Group an African-focused private equity advisory and commodity trading firm. His work with Obsidian is contributing directly to creating solutions that will increase the developmental impact on the African continent, and he hopes to do more to improve the African narrative. Ashley, you are welcome. Thank you very much. OK, our next speaker is Sewu Steve Tevia. He is an investment professional with over 20 years of professional experience in development finance, consulting, impact investing, and venture capital funds in Europe and Africa. He is also an active business angel and early stage investor across Africa, both Francophone and Anglophone. A 
fully bilingual English French, Seu has managed more than 360 million US dollars of investment and catalyzed over 100 million in investment in 150 plus SME and startups across 26 countries in Africa. He has networks across Europe, US, and Africa in private equity, venture capital, and development finance. He's an alumnus of London Business School and has a executive leadership certificate from Stanford GSB. He holds a number of professional charter, that's CAIA, that's Alternative Investment, CIFE, Islamic Finance, Prince to that's project management, Toastmaster, public speaking, while being a GKA character down and a zone data holder. Terry, are you welcome, sir? Hey, that was long ago. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this uh, this is our next speaker is Ebenezer Isuman, a very good friend. He's a business and project manager with Emory Invest overseeing six major international standard projects, including a construction of an airstrip, theme park, and a multi-purpose cable car network. He's the columnist on future of banking with the Business and Financial Times and other third party online platforms, and an Amazon published author of books, including More Than Good and Writer Premier. He's a, he holds BA in economics and geography from the University of Cape Coast and an MBA in finance from the Open University of Malaysia. He also has certificate in broadcast journalism from the Ghana Institute of Journalism and studied with Writers Bureau UK and College of African Professional Writers. He's an LLB student and a CGIA charter holder. Mr. Suman, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Our final but not the least speaker is Richard Brands is a founder and CEO of Code Train. Code Train empowers young Africans to rise digitally by transforming them into professional software developers and matches them to do to matches them to job opportunities so that they can realize their dreams. Code Train has two locations in Ghana, Accra and Kumasi, where students in-person training in mobile and web app development in the training program. With students flying in from several African countries to join their Ghanaian counterpart to become software developers, Code Train is set to, to be a pan African leader in tech skills and recruitment. Richard was selected among the 100 best innovators in the world to join Startup Chile, one of the biggest startup accelerators um, globally. While in Chile, he presented guest lectures at local universities such as Universidad de Mayo. Richard, you are welcome. Thank you. So uh, we are going to do justice to the topic, but whilst the discussions are going on, I will humbly ask our uh, panelists to use our Q&A section. If they have any question, they can just type in the Q&A. If they want the question to a specific speaker, they can add the name to it so that when the speaker is able to, is done with the presentation, we will then look at the questions and channel the questions to them. So now let's start it this way. Investing in innovation, leveraging on technology in critical moments. I want to take brief introduction on the topic from all speakers. So I want to start with Gary. Gary, what is your initial impression on innovation and technology in times of like a crisis, especially like COVID-19? Yes, th thank you very much for the question. Uh, I, I think it's really important that we make a, a clear de uh, delineation about technology and the word technology, right? Because there's lots of different types of technology in the world. Specifically, we're in this event today to talk about information technology. And what's really, really important is to understand that technology essentially is a platform that accelerates intent. Right. So there's lots of different types of technology. There's computers, there's toilets, there's there's cars. There's lots of different types of technologies that accelerate intent that we touch every day that we might not necessarily think of 
as accelerating your intent. But that's what they're made to do, to make your life safer, healthier, more prosperous. And in times of critical moments, particularly in, in this COVID environment, you know, it, it's really about those micro moments where you look around and you're looking for a piece of technology that can accelerate towards a goal that you have, right? All of us usually have three to five large goals that we have in life. Um, those are broken into shorter term goals. And in times where things are so disruptive, you really got to step back, collect yourself and think about what is that right piece of technology that can help me in this critical moment to accelerate towards and faster towards what I'm trying to accomplish. Thank you for the question. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Richard, when you look at technology and innovation, is there any linkage between technology and innovation? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, so, I mean, I, I see technology to be basically new and better ways of doing things. You know, so technology is not only limited to computers per se, it's um, how you, you know, do things in new and better ways. And um, I think that is very, very strongly linked to innovation because um, you always have to think about how to do things better. Um, I mean, for businesses, yeah, you know, you have to think about how you can, you know, change um, the way things are done such that you are going to have a 10x effect um, on, on outcomes. And that has to do a lot with um, rethinking your process, um, you know, strategizing, and you know, putting in the kind of the kind of structure that can enable that happen, and also leveraging on um, existing infrastructure that um, already is lying out there that you can you know you can use um, to get that 10x um, you know effect. So I think that technology is is um, is you know in terms of the way you, you think about it. Technology and innovation are very similar, but tech is more about the, the tools that you use, you know, to, to implement whatever innovative ideas or whatever innovation that you have. Thank you, Richard. Um, Ashley, what's your initial comment on the topic, investing in innovation, leveraging on technology in critical moments? Um, for us um, as a business, I think it's quite important that we look at technology more broadly um, and innovation for us is a journey. Um, obviously, in this new business environment, um, it's important to, as a business, to address growing concerns and that comes from innovation, the willingness to learn um, and change things. So for us, we see innovation as businesses that are trying to address um, the dynamic and challenging economy that we see ourselves in. So um, that, that, that's my thoughts on the, 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 the topic. Okay, that's great, that's great. Uh, Mr. Tevia, can you also give us your in initial reaction on the topic? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, my, my other colleagues have covered a lot of ground already. What I may add is that the, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of a bit of a difference between innovation and technology. So I'll, I'll explain why. Innovation can be operational process, thinking, et cetera, et cetera, innovation. And that can be applied to any underlying, which would be technology. So I'll give you an example. I strongly believe that uh, contrary to most people in Africa, I strongly believe that process innovation in Africa, at least let's say in agriculture, in industry, etc., is much more important than the technology per se. I'll give you an example. Um, it's programming a website or a mobile phone app will not change the life, I think, of certain farmers who are still using the hoe, right? I always wonder why in Africa, contrary to Asia, we don't have those tricycles that a lot of people are using now today to move in the, in the secondary cities in Ghana. Why don't they adapt it to have something that they can plow the land? This is process innovation. And I'll stop there. Awesome, 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 awesome. I, I, I like the drift of how you ended your initial reaction. I'm sure when we get into the uh, nitty gritties and the actual matters, you are going to give us more insight. 
With pleasure. Yes. Okay, so our final speaker to give us his opening remark will be Mr. Isuman. Even the topic, investing in innovation, leveraging on technology in critical moments. Your initial reaction. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Um, okay, so um, let me just, um, I think that virtually all of them have touched on it and uh, these are on point. But let me just quickly add that, you know, I believe that whatever we do, whatever you try to innovate, whatever you would want to bring out new, always begins from the mind. So whether it is processes, whether it is whatever, you create it in your mind and possibly in your heart before you bring it out. So I believe that innovation and technology, they are intertwined. So you would always have to innovate in the mind. I mean, when you see something going on, I mean, this is um, a business and you would want to scale up, you would want to bring something new, dynamism, something that is not seen before, or even if it's been seen, you want to improve on it. So you will innovate in the mind. And then in the process of bringing it out, you will use certain tools, certain things that probably are beyond human limitation. So once you get hold of those things to be able to use them to bring your innovation to fruition, then we are talking about technology. So I see them as intertwined. And this is very crucial, you know, um, the fact that we had uh, from the beginning when we, st uh, we had um, 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 industrial revolution, that began now, we are talking of uh, evolution 4.0. It has grown over the years. And technology definitely, for me, is inevitable. It's something that was going to happen. That is why there have been development. Otherwise, probably we would have been stuck to where we are. And as we move forward, we, try, we believe that and we know that um, this has come to be with us and we need to embrace it. So I strongly believe that technology and innovation are intertwined. Thank Wonderful. You. Let me start the second round on you. When you talk of investing in innovation, where should businesses focus their attention on? Because innovation is, is, is not something that you can really feel in, the, in literal meaning, like literal word meaning. So how can businesses invest in innovation with their mindset that innovation and technology is linked together? Okay, so thank you very much once again. I mean. Again, I mean, the, the question we need to ask ourselves is, why do we even need it? Why do we have to innovate? Why do we need technology? I mean, clearly over the years, um, businesses and the things that we do that we see around us have had challenges. And I see these challenges coming from, you know, legacy platforms that have been built over the years. You know, these are infrastructure that, um, as it is, where, where have become, I wouldn't say obsolete, but then... Um, you will have to go through a lot of time when you have to do maintenance. You know, on some of these things, you spend so much because these have become platforms that have been there, old-fashioned architecture. You understand that you would want to. So the question then is, if this is what we have and we want to improve and make it much better, then of course, that's where technology comes in. And we are talking of the fact that once you have identified these things are becoming challenges and not making you progress, then you talk about investing Up for investment it can be invested in so many ways. It is very, very important. So we believe that the first one that I will speak about is always looking at um, platforms that support financial inclusion. At the end of the day, when you want to innovate, when you want to leverage technology, it is still going to affect the bottom line. I mean, no business person goes into it and becomes like Father Christmas. We want to do business and that is it. We want to make money. So in as much as possible that we were leveraging or we're using old-fashioned technology where doing these legacy platforms and still churning out profits because that's the bottom line for the shareholder. Then again, when it comes to technology, the first investment we should look at is investing in platforms that will support financial inclusion. You know, I mean, whether we like it or not, the digital economy is, is rapidly developing worldwide. That is, that is the largest driver of innovation. Every competition, every growth requires a digital thing to do. These days, I mean, and whether we like it or not, like I said earlier, it has come to be with us. So even though many people, you know, have been excluded, there are lots of opportunities that are available for this. And so I urge businesses and companies and all those that are coming up that invest in platforms that would always support financial inclusion. Another thing I can add quickly 
is that you may not be able to do it alone. In fact, when it comes to this, doing it alone can be a challenge. So when you want to invest in this platform, then you're also looking at collaboration. And when we say collaboration, you want to collaborate with firms, firms that are already in it, fintech firms. These that are already in there, that is, that is their DNA. That is what they do. And your business may not have that. So you would want to collaborate with them. And when you do that, you are sure that you can, you can move on. So maybe I'll just mention this for want of time. And then as we move forward, I can talk about other things. So invest in legal platforms that will support financial inclusion and collaborate with FinTech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amen. Uh, Gary, I want to push this question to the same question. Is it necessary for businesses to look at investing in innovation? Is it necessary? What will happen if businesses decide not to invest in innovation? I want us to pick it from that angle before we come to the critical moments like COVID-19. Yes, th thank you very much for the question. I, I want to build first off what, and, and I think he was spot on, right? Sorry. Innovation takes investment. Um, and in a lot of ways, Hello. how you invest towards innovation is uh, really, really important, right? So at the, at the startup scale, you know, you really want to look at how you structure Hello. your chief definitive aim. Gary, Gary can you hear us? In... Hello, Gary, please. Can you please repeat the question? Because the, the moderator's question was very broken down. We couldn't hear. So please repeat the question before you proceed. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, but we couldn't okay. hear the moderator's question. Yeah. Okay. So if you can repeat the moderator's question for all of us, we can okay. hear you clearly. Okay, perfect. Ah. So the moderator's question basically was, um, is it necessary for businesses to look at investment in innovation and what will happen if businesses don't invest in innovation? And in particular, what happens if you don't invest in innovation in a, in a critical time? Uh, those were basically his three questions. So, you know, that's why I started with in the startup scale, looking at your chief definitive aim. And then when you get to scale, you know, there's a really simple formula is when you're scaling a company culture, process, knowledge. A lot of folks do it the opposite, you know, where they do process culture knowledge. And culture is what is actually supposed to inform the process and the process is supposed to scale the knowledge, right? So CPK is the best way to think about it. Um, so, you know, culture is what creates the community and what allows for investment to take place that's accelerated by technology. So when it comes to, you know, is it necessary to innovate? Absolutely. I mean, that is, <laughs> just look at the human condition over the past 10,000 years, right? Look at the, the, look at what has happened to our species in the, ten, the past 10,000 years. Take it out of the business context for a second. Innovation is at the core of every single one of our genomes. And when you want to be successful, you have to be adaptable. You have to be resilient. You have to have a chief definitive aim. Innovation is, I was saying, you know, to begin what I was, what I had said, innovation doesn't always mean a physical thing. It can be a mental, physical, emotional, or spiritual investment. It doesn't always have to be financial. Um, and a lot of times the things that aren't financial are more important in building a scalable business. Now, if you don't spend the time you know, as I tell our early stage business owners and even some of my executive clients, the individual reflects the business and vice versa. So if you're not straight in your, men, in your mind, your heart and your soul, your business is going to have cracks. And so you Hello, we lost hand, you. if you spend the time 
to accelerate yourself in the right ways as a leader, then investing always makes sense. So I know things have kind of broken up here a couple of times, but hopefully that made sense. Okay, wonderful. I, I hope my connection is, is better now. <clears throat> yeah, it's better now. And we pray it doesn't break up again. And my connection is better now. It is. Okay, okay. So um, the same question, invest in innovation. I want to push the question to Ashley. And um, we all know that innovation and technology comes at a great cost to businesses. So most businesses, since one way or the other, want to always shelve away from, I mean, investing in technology. Before COVID-19, most businesses who were seen as the middle class didn't invest so much into uh, investment into technology and innovation. In, in times like this, why is it necessary for businesses to invest, looking at what is happening and what is likely to happen afterwards? Ashley. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, yes, so we believe it's really important to, to invest, broadly speaking. Um, but I want to take a step back. I think it's important to understand the importance of information um, within this chain of investing in innovation. I think it's important to address or assess information um, because if you look at other markets, you can use that as a, as a guide to our potential market. And if you assess um, your potential addressable market, you can see the importance that information can feed your, your decision or your vision as a company in terms of investments. So in terms of addressing innovation, Innovation is really important. It's important to be innovative, um, to grow, um, to be ever dynamic. Um, and technology obviously allows companies in an ever present dynamic world to achieve that. Um, you can achieve that through um, potentially scaling, um, addressing more people through technology. Um, so I think for businesses, um, it's easy to say, yes, um, we're in, a, in, a, and in an environment where we've never been before. Um, the things are changing, customers are um, going more cashless, but understand why they're doing that. Understand where the market is going to be in potentially a year, two, three, five years time. And that comes from assessing information. So for us as a company, we're heavily invested in um, information. We're heavily invested in technology because of that information that we, we tend to gather. Um, and in my work where I've um, done some work for a VC um, in the UK called Good Soul VC, um, we, we understand that. So we, we look at startups who are addressing a certain market and they have information to back that. Obviously, there's other components that guide our investment decision, um, such as team, um, such as the actual MVP. But we, we like information and we believe that information is really important. So for most Ghanaian companies that are now thinking about um, their tech strategy, we would urge you guys to... to go out there into the market, do some research, find out how to best communicate with your, with your clients. Um, not all businesses should be tech, um, should solely be tech. Some businesses, it's important to be tech enabled. What that means is that having technology to support your underlying core, core business. So we believe that technology is an important driver or an, or an important decision maker in terms of that, 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 decision process. I hope that answers your question from my point of view. Thank you very much for your submission. Um, Steve, um, we are still talking about investing in innovation. Let's take a typical industry like the health sector. How can businesses in the health sector invest in technology and innovation relating to their industry? Oh, thank you very much for the question. It seems that as if you knew what I was doing uh, over the last few years. <laughs> so I, I'm actually, as an angel investor, I've invested in health tech startups, so both in Kenya and in, uh, in Ghana. And what I've realized is that it's kind of topical today, but 
funny enough, I had invested in this health tech startup before COVID. And what I can tell you is that, um, again, for this particular one, it's not really about, uh, you know, uh, technology, IT or programming or software innovation, it, even though it is to some extent, but it's also in terms of research. And one of the things I've noticed, and especially from the, the healthcare and uh, med tech and tech, is that contrary to most of the investment opportunities that are out there, you cannot do a health tech or med tech without a medical person on your team. That means that essentially it's one of the only industries where you cannot really know what you're talking about if you haven't gone through the motions or if you haven't got experts on your team. I always say, look, uh, anybody, that's the way I believe things are. In, 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 and then obviously uh, Gary mentioned it, mankind has evolved by learning accidentally sometimes or deliberately some other times. But in medical field, you have to study, you need experts. And that's where I strongly believe that going forward, there'll be a bit more industries going that, in that direction where in the health tech se sector, when I see the evolution of uh, one of our, for me, it's, it should be a national pride in Ghana, which is Mpharma with Gregory Roxon. I've, I've done a number of case studies as part of the Accra Angels Network that we've set up in Ghana to get angel investors to invest. I did a case study and essentially, you know, the, the entrepreneur and the, and the investors have managed to plow in 56.3 million over the last six years, which is an outstanding feat for a Ghanaian-born startup that went through Israel and the US to find investors. And what I hope is that going down the road, we have more of those ones where the, it, it combines, uh, you know, health, technology, but also, and actually, funny enough, they don't talk about it too much, but a lot of impact in terms of reaching out to the poorest people, providing adequate um, medication with the ch checking the quality of the medication, de developing the value chain. And this is probably the biggest uh, achievement of M Pharma that not many people know. Basically, they've managed to digitize, model, and make much more of efficient the value chain, the medical value chain. And I'll, I'll finish with something that is crazy, is now it's a technology company that is going to buy a brick and mortar company. Actually, M Pharma went to buy out the big, second biggest chain of pharmacies in Kenya, right? Called Halton's. So can you imagine that a Ghanaian startup, health tech, grew so much that he realized that for, for, for the company to have more impact, and create more opportunities for investors as well, it had to go and buy a physical chain of stores in Kenya. So when you talk about innovation, it's also in terms of investment strategy innovation. So as, and I really, uh, you know, I'm in alignment with what Gary said. Uh, the sooner, if you can imagine it, you can do it. And a lot of people really don't realize that's fundamentally the thing. And I mentioned, you know, the... Uh, the Elon Musk and other people who have imagined something and managed to execute it. The biggest challenge most of the time for entrepreneurs and even for anybody is you can think about something, but the real difference is the execution and the consistency in execution. It's hard. So uh, innovation in healthcare is a great opportunity going forward. And maybe I'll, I'll probably talk about the second example, which is also quite um, telling is one of the biggest challenges we have in Africa is the size of the continent and the, the, the amount of people that are out of big cities. That means that healthcare is not readily accessible to them. Look, technology has brought the ability to do medical diagnostics from phone, from, from your phone. So basically, you can get a retina scan that will give the software a lot of information about your blood pressure, your uh, uh, insulin level, and so many other factors that actually you would never imagine can be done today. So technology is really transforming the health tech, healthcare sector. And hopefully going forward, anybody who has a feature phone or is a, a, uh, a, yeah, a small feature phone can get so many services, so, many, uh, 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 so much help in terms of 
manage people's health, even in the remotest area. So innovation in healthcare is going to change, hopefully with a, a lot more funding, the, the, the face of, of, uh, of Africa first and then the rest of the world. And I'll finish one thing, what news that came recently. There's a, a company in Nigeria called uh, the Flying Doctors. So they've been building their knowledge of tackled part of the, uh, the COVID-19 issues. And now they've actually announced uh, the last three days that they're going to raise a billion dollar fund, which is the biggest ever in Africa for healthcare, one. But two, it pales in comparison to the needs that are on the continent. So going forward, I think you should look, this, look at the space. A lot more funds are going to be raised uh, in that sector. We've got also Sangu Dele with the, uh, uh, his Africa Healthcare Fund, a number of investors. So clearly, there's a lot of opportunity for innovation in investing in innovation in the health tech sector in, on the continent and across. Thank you very much. That was very, very insightful. I will then switch to Richard. And the same question of investment, this time not the health sector, I want us to look at the financial sector. What are the investments in technology and innovative practices that the financial sector as a whole should also be considering going forward? Yeah, thanks a lot, um, Patrick. Um, be before that, I wanted to just make a comment on, um, on the health sector as well. I, I, I think, yeah, um, go ahead. In in um, in everything, you know, technology, innovation, investment, and um, one thing that makes everything work together, you know, is talent. You know, access to to talent, access to world trained talent. You need local talents to be able to build the infrastructure, to maintain them, to occupy um, you know mid level senior positions you know, on, on the continent. And um, it's, it's very, very important. Um, let me make an example. Um, in um, next week, Friday, uh, we have our graduating class after just one year of training. Um, they took um, four weeks to build, you know, five apps against COVID in Ghana. You know, and it includes apps um, that enable doctors, to, doctors in quarantine to work from home even, um, you know, assisting as well, even while they are quarantining or they are, they are home. Um, it enables, there, there's another app that enables medical health professionals across the country to share real-time information and insights, um, even as they work to, you know, to fight um, COVID. And, and these, these apps were just built in, in, you know, in four weeks. So imagine if we had um, so much investment um, in talents to, you know, companies could invest in talent locally, um, or there could be investments in, in you know, in, in talent um, to support, um, you know, all this dig digital transformation we talk about, you know, in, in whatever industry it is. Um, in the financial sector, um, what, what I, I, I see is um, mostly um, financial inclusion. And, um, you know, when you move, on my streets in my house, you know, it's, it's about 300 meters streets. There are over 10 mobile money shops sitting just on that street. And um, about 10 years ago, it wasn't like that. Or oh, 15 years ago, there was nothing. And um, that tells you that a huge percentage of the economy actually um, rests on, um, you know, works outside the banking space. You know, they, 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 they are able to, you know, do transactions, do everything, but it doesn't contribute to anything financial. It doesn't give them any financial credits. They don't have, they can't go for loans. They can't, you know, they are not in the financial system. Um, and I believe I agree with um, the idea of, you know, supporting um, innovations that can enable everybody to be included in, in, in um, <clears throat> In, in, in financial, uh, um, in the financial sector. And one way to do this would be to start with businesses, you know, to start with businesses. Um, if we, we start working with, because it's, it's much easier, um, you know, platforms that can enable businesses to score some financial, you know, some credits, um, and so that they can, you know, get loans 
or they can be able to um, get support in times of COVID, for instance, is an example. And um, talking about, talking from what I do at CoTrain, um, we train, you know, software developers, technology people, and match them to companies. And um, some of the companies are banks, right? And one of my observations is that we don't have so many, um, you know, so many players in our financial industry actually raising their own, you know, talents, um, nurturing their own talents and building solutions, you know, locally. So most of the solutions are, are basically solutions that one bank tried, you know, and it worked and everybody copies. Um, I, I feel that nobody is actually trying to solve the critical problems, you know, that are there. You know, no one, no, there, there isn't any players or uh, maybe there is no investment, but there isn't, you know, enough players taking some risks to solve some of the critical problems that can actually give us, um, you know, access to um, creating millions of jobs, not tens, not hundreds, millions of jobs, millions of opportunities. And um, that is one of my observations um, um, as well. So I think, I, I, you know, I think um, if we are able to create opportunities for financial inclusion, maybe starting from businesses, and if we are able to um, nurture, um, you know, local talent and invest in local talent, um, I believe we can make a lot of progress in the next 10 years. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, before we, we, we go on, I think I have a question here that I want Gary to assist me with. Um, we have a question from Ebenezer Mansa, and he says that my experience in life tells me that the old architecture goes obsolete eventually and becomes the icons another day or current trends or the order of the day. Is this correct? So I want to say what can, what we call innovation today becomes absolute tomorrow. Is it correct, Gary? Yeah, I, I would love to hear uh, my other fellow panelists advice on this. So I'll be very quick. Uh, look, innovation is all about timing. You know, there's different social, political, and economic cycles in every town, city, country, region, and continent. And understanding where particularly the technological cycle is and where the social cycle is really matters. And that's why I put the answer in the, you know, uh, the, to the question about the Gartner hype cycle, because there are a lot of folks whose job it is to understand these cycles. And for you to understand the intersection of kind of what's emerging, but hasn't crested as a wave. So what's on the, you know, a wave that's emerging and what can you build? What differentiation, what value proposition, what team can you put together that has a very clear and actionable vision that customers are willing to pay for so that by the time that wave crests, you're already a growing company with 20, 30, 50 employees and can continue to scale up accordingly. Because if you build a company while is a technological or social cycle is already at its peak, the, the only way it's going to go eventually, just like any wave, is down. So I'll leave it at that, and I'd love to hear what my other panelists have to say. Yes, yeah, so can I hear from you? Um, Steve, I want you to also touch on this same question before I go to Ashley. No, it, 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 thank you very much, John Patrick. Uh, it, essentially, we, it goes back to, I, I would say, some sort of economic theory around ways of innovation, etc. And I would say, you know, if I remember well, it's Kondratiev uh, uh, that talks about ways of innovation, etc. And it goes back to the same thing. The cycle is the same idea. So, you know, uh, like in the early days of the automobile and uh, Madame Benz was the, the biggest promoter of it because she, she drove the, the Benz car across the, the, the whole regions in, in Germany and really promoted the, the, the Benz. That was an innovation, right? And so obviously now we've got Tesla, which is a fully electric car, but Tesla is, I would say, an, a, an innovation or incremental innovation compared to all the electric cars that the Japanese were already doing, but just they took it a step further. So again, um, as mentioned, 
um, it's just like cycles and whether or not you're at the bottom or the, t or the top of the cycle determines really the, the way your startup is going to grow. I was actually writing something about the waves of innovation for, for that matter, but really startups. Personally, I'm, as an angel investor, I can tell you, I'm squeezing myself in terms of financial commitment, et cetera, to be able to invest now. Because I was there during the, the 2001, 2001 dot-com bubble. I was there, obviously, 2008, 2008, 2009, but even before. So each of those crises have spawned five, three, five, ten years after new startup, new companies that have actually come to dominate the, the, the ecosystems. So when you look at it, you know, Google, Facebook, WhatsApp, all of those startups were started in one, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2008, 2009, you've got other ones. Those, they're so regular waves. And I strongly believe that if you look at it today and scan the market, there are few startups that are going to be the leading ones in the future. Funny enough, when we sit in Africa or Western Europe or the US to some extent, but mostly Western Europe and Africa, in Africa, I think it's a bit, a bit further, I would say it's in terms of for certain information, we don't realize that there are organizations like Ant Financial, Alibaba Group and others that have actually digitized a whole economy. We're talking about fintech and there's one particular YouTube video I would recommend everybody to look to watch if they can, it's called Bank 4.0. And I'll have to find out the, the person's name again, the, the speaker, but essentially demonstrate that now China is so much in advance from us in terms of FinTech and so many other things that the next big wave of innovation is likely to come from China, right? And we uh, in, in Africa need to start looking at that and seeing how we can partner and understand what's going on there to really start re developing ourselves. And, you know, um, uh, I think it was Ebenezer or Richard who mentioned talent and skills. This is where I think that we should really be looking at a way to systematically build our talent base. And that's one of the reasons why I've also invested in net tech startup to build our talent base, to get to the next level as soon as we can. So again, the, the, for me, the next wave of innovation after China has to be Africa. But then we need to put the building blocks in place to do so. And I believe that the African Union with Smart, uh, Smart Africa, I think they call it, or Smart, yeah, Smart Africa, which is an initiative to help the whole continent digitize itself and bring sandboxes across different value chains and sectors for people to grow. So there's a, there's a, there's a clear path to innovation, but again, it's probably lack of information, not access to it, or lack of vision, unfortunately, for some of our leaders to understand that this is happening. I got a name, the, the person's name is Brett King, and if we type Bank 4.0 and the Future of Financial Services, it's about 40 minute video, watch it. I've watched it like every single week since I discovered it, which is about the three months ago, nearly every single week, maybe not every single week. So, Again, ways of innovation come and go. I think what happened, let's say on the mobile, Africa is now mobile first anyway. On the mobile side, organizations like M-Pesa showed the way with Safaricom, et cetera. So it became like a hotbed of innovation in terms of mobile. But when you look at it, and financial and so many other Chinese organizations have taken it way further. And really we need to wake up and really start going that way. I think. I'll stop with that. One of the opportunities we have in that, in, in, on the continent is that we don't have the legacy systems that the US or the Europe or and to some extent China had. We can build and leapfrog that. We've talked about leapfrog for a long time, but I think it's even more opportune now to get there. And I strongly believe that, for instance, Africa, if we build things well, we could be the hotbed of cybersecurity, we could be the hot, uh, hot, uh, the place where people come look for talent, not just technical talent, but also in human interaction talent. And there's a real opportunity to do that in a much more sustainable way going forward. 
Sorry, I get passionate sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's also quite insightful. Actually, I want you to also tie on, on the same question of uh, because technology today becomes obsolete tomorrow, is it something that we should still be committing effort and energy into? Yes, certainly. I think, as I said before, it's a growing concern. And if you look at um, large companies that were well, large then, like Nokia, BlackBerry, Kodak, Blockbuster, they, they failed to, to understand the, the importance of innovation as a journey rather than a destination. Um, so it's important for any business to understand and evolve with time. So um, within, within um, the financial services, services space, we're seeing large waves of innovation across Europe, across the Americas, um, and you can see our continent is lagging far behind. I mean, we've got data to say that we've transacted over $400 billion in mobile money payments. Um, most of that were in East Africa in three countries. If you look at our part of West Africa, what, what are we doing to, to, to um, allow that, that wave of innovation? Um, and we're, we're doing little to nothing. I mean, if you consider the amount of incubators, accelerators we have locally, you'll see that we're, we're not doing so much from a governmental point of view. And as Steve rightly said, um, businesses are not supporting that as well. We don't really hire, sorry, Richard said, we, we're not really hiring talent um, from the space of, of, of technology. So I think it's really important that we understand that it's a continuous journey. And in Obsidian, Good Soul VC, we do that. We understand that and we try and work with the youngest, brightest talents. And for us, it's all about learning. Um, someone mentioned the lack of vision. Um, the lack of vision is, is really key in terms of seeing some people's demise. So one needs to be very, have great foresight um, in terms of the largest companies in the world. I mean, when Elon Musk was starting Tesla, how many of us thought it was a crazy thing to do? Um, same for Zoom. And these companies are like one of the top performing companies across the NASDAQ. So if you, if you look across most of the large companies, I think you'll, you'll find that these leaders understand the importance of innovation and growth. Um, and this is something that I believe companies like BlackBerry, Kodak and Blockbuster lacked in terms of not seeing the opportunity with Netflix when they approached Blockbuster. And then in terms of finance, um, we believe that the, the banking space is quite monolithic. Um, the incumbent banks um, um, focus a lot on their P&L and, and little to no, no real focus on the future. And, and I believe because of that, you're going to see um, the tech sector um, shave off some of their market share as they're doing in Europe and America, where you're seeing companies like um, Apple Pay um, taking, taking quite a lot of payments and you'll see large tech companies veer into the financial space um, in a chase for, for more clients. Um, you're seeing different levels of innovation through um, banking as a service. You're looking at infrastructure as a service, compliance as a service, balance sheet as a service. So I think we're lacking behind in Africa and I, I believe in the financial inclusion that we can potentially foster in our market. Um, but yes, I'm saying quite a lot of things, but what I want to drive at is the fact that there is a lot of opportunity across the financial markets um, and innovation is key. Um, I want to urge startups who are listening um, to really think about partnerships think about the right companies to partner with, to leverage in terms of innovation. Um, they don't potentially need to have a banking license to potentially offer products in, in loans or lending. Um, this is something that other markets have adapted and something that we need to think about locally. Um, so yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. That's quite insightful. <clears throat> I have a question here from Emmanuel Amfusaki. He says, uh, a lot of startups and companies do recognize the importance of technology. 
but the crux of the matter is the cost factor. Any intervention of cost effective technology in these trying times. Eben, can you assist us with um, any help to these companies who, yes, they know of, of the importance of technology innovation in times like this, but the cost factor puts them off. Okay. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I must admit that, I mean, yes, um, as we say, nothing comes cheap. Um, so definitely, I mean, innovation and all that um, definitely is expensive. But look at this. I mean, when you, when, when you purchase a car, a vehicle, a car today, and let's say the cost of it is um, 100 cities, you know, the, the truth is that in five years, or yeah, maybe, maybe a little more, you may probably be thinking of disposing it. But in five years, when you calculate how much you spend on maintenance, trying to maintain the vehicle, the car, when you put, you quantify all, you put it together and just suppose with the amount you spent at the time of purchase, you'll be surprised that you probably would have spent more, you know. So what am I saying? So definitely when you are having, you, you do not want to innovate and get these things that you think that, oh, because of cost, I would have to wait and do this. It would happen. And a very good example, so I have a friend who many years ago was carrying out a venture after he did the financial analysis and everything and Obviously, he didn't have the money, the capital, you know. But then um, after sitting down quietly and reflecting in his sober moments, he was able to think about something innovative. Okay, so he, first of all, as we say in, in business, we say that the first point of call, you speak with friends and family. If you are doing a startup, you don't jump to the banks or anywhere. Friends and family, and then you go gradually. Maybe you meet angel investors and all that. So this guy just had that in the had the wisdom and the mindset to speak with about a hundred people starting with family members and asking each of them he prepared something it was just a small short letter like writing a letter for an official letter to somebody or someplace and asking each of them to assist him with a certain amount for what he wanted to do you'll be amazed to know that eventually he had so much about twice the amount he was looking for to start a venture you know so most of the time we kind of push back because we are always scared of, 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 of the cost. But what is at the other side of fear, you would, you would definitely want to go for that because fear will never take you anywhere. You understand? It is a very, it is a very, very good something that we, we all have to look at. And I'm sure that um, 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 Steve will speak about because he does a lot of this as an angel investor, he knows these things and he will specifically mention some of them. But I can tell him that there are a lot out there that are waiting for him. Get your business plan. Whatever you would want to do, speak with these people. What technology do you want to go to? What innovation do you want to embark on? I can tell you that there are lots of people waiting out there for you to just come, present it to them, you know, and, and they are there to help you. That is the fact of the matter. It is because we do not take that step. It is expensive, like I said, but if you quantify how much you would spend in the course of the period or you would want to look at the things that you have been doing in the past, you'll be amazed that in the long term, this will become cheaper and you would want to go. So the cost should not scare anybody that would want to because innovation is not cheap. There's nothing good that comes cheap. It is expensive. But like I explained, eventually in the long term, the benefits will show you clearly that after all, this was not expensive. So I think that the issue has to do with, it's not so much about the cost, but the issue has to do with the people who are venturing into this, why they always fear to push forward and look for help. Thank you. Patrick, Thank do you mind you. if I come in quickly uh, yes, on yes, this one? Yes, yes, please come in. <laughs> yeah, just, just a quick one on that. And thank you very much for those uh, kind words. The, the other point I would say is that it seems to me that a lot of time it's true. It's not a, a lot of thing, people think about the funding, but, and also they do not speak, talk enough to people about their idea because they're always thinking somebody's going to steal it and go and do it for them. But they are the ones who envisioned it. So if they envision it in a certain way, even if somebody is pretending to steal the idea to go and implement it, they will not implement it the way you thought about it if you really thought it through. So very, very often in Africa, it just, does, just doesn't apply only for, for Ghana. 
once you have the idea, and many people may have the same idea, the difference is the execution. So don't be afraid to talk to people, share your ideas, fine tune it. They'll help you fine tune it. And maybe somebody you've spoken to will actually put the money in. So please, innovation, and if you want to start something, tell people about it, and so you can refine it, and eventually we'll get somebody to invest in it. Thank you okay. very much for that yeah, talk. I'll, up. Yeah, I would like to say a few things to, um, to add to what Steve said. Okay, okay. Um, well, a lot of the times, people come to me with, you know, projects, especially like startups and um, businesses that have a budget and they have money um, to build apps for them. And um, these are some of my observations. One thing I, I mean, the, 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 the thing about, you know, stealing ideas is, is really, really interesting. Um, there are so many cases where someone approaches us and um, can you build, uh, you know, this, you know, technology for us? Um, and you ask them, what is the technology? And they don't want to tell you, but they, they want you to figure out what they want, you know. But um, I, I've, I've learned, you know, three main things that most people don't know. Uh, uh, Richard, not to cut yeah. you, but are, are these not genuine concerns? Um, so I think... Um, when I go to my next point, you understand um, what well, there are genuine concerns, but I, I think that they don't know how to approach it. The, the problem is the how part. Um, and I, 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 that's why I've noticed three main things that could help um, people, you know, overcome this, this problem. Um, the first one is um, figuring out you know, what will be your minimum viable product and transforming it into technical specifications, documents. The second one is how to adopt lean methodologies so that you don't, ha you don't have to spend so much money in building an infrastructure, you know, that you are not even sure that your customers are going to even like. And then the, the third one is talent, you know, planning on, you know, because if you are talking about, you know, saving costs, you need to plan in the, in the long term to have your own team um, to manage the infrastructure. So the first one is the most important, which is the figuring out to build your MVP. That's where the problem is. Um, me as a software developer, I don't need your idea per se, right? I need a technical specifications document which tells me what I'm supposed to build, right? And even beyond that, you can always sign an, MV, uh, an NDA um, with me. But the, the, the main problem is I realize most of them don't understand um, how to craft out a, a minimum viable product. So for instance, you, need to, you want to create um, Facebook um, and your idea is, you want to be able to connect people. So from, the, from day one, you might not necessarily mean, uh, need video sharing capabilities. You might not necessarily uh, need um, live, you know, um, um, live streaming capabilities. Maybe you only need um, the ability for people to share their profile and connect to each other. So most, most people think that in order to build a product, you need to get in so many features, so many things that you might not even need, you know, to start with. And that actually uh, makes the cost very, very high. But when uh, startups are able to figure out what is the most important aspect of um, a product that they need to build now, you know, and then what we usually do is we are able to um, translate um, the future features into a bucket list of things to do. And with a product roadmap, right? So you have a product, a five-year product roadmap or a three-year product road, roadmap, um, and with each year costing, an, let's say, X amount. So for now, you only need that X amount to be able to build the first version. So, um, and that also goes with, you know, the second point, which is adopting lean and agile methods, right? Um, and the third one is continuity. Even when you build the app, um, building a, a technology product is like, um, is like a baby. The baby needs to be nourished. The baby needs attention. The baby needs um, resources. So you still need it. You know, you don't get it. Yeah. 
Yeah, be, uh, because of our time, can we wrap up on, on, on this uh, particular uh, topic? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So my point is, um, I mean, my last point is on, you know, um, planning for future talents who are going to, you know, maintain the product and, you know, continue building the roadmap of, um, of the product. So I think these are the three main things that when, you know, startups and entrepreneurs or companies, you know, are able to adopt, they can actually lower the cost and also minimize the risk as well for investors. Thank you very much, Richard. Looking at my watch, we have just about eight minutes to end the session. I want to just do a recap of whatever we want to say or what we have been discussing by taking about, let's say, a minute from each of you. Just look at where we are now, COVID-19. Going forward, how do you see technology transforming businesses between now and the future? I need one minute from each person, starting with Gary. Yes, thank you for the question. And, and I really appreciate all the insights that, that my colleagues have shared. You know, in this time with, uh, you know, an unstable and unknown future in a lot of ways, technology, frankly, is core in, in every single business. You know, as one of my colleagues talked about, Africa is a mobile first continent. And the opportunity to leapfrog and the opportunity to put ICT at the core of our industries across the continent is very unique. There's nowhere else in the world where this is a true opportunity across an entire continent. So, you know, a digital first mentality, a digital first mindset uh, and adapting with some of the points that, that Richard had just kindly shared with us is, is really important. But as all my colleagues also said, you know, time and drive is really what matters here. You know, we can talk about technology to accelerate intent and to be building a relevant company, but at the same point in time, you have to put in the work. Nothing's going to come easy. And that's the opposite side of technology at this time the amount of time and the amount of drive that you have to have. Have you sent 500 emails? Out of those 500 emails, 100 people will respond and out of those 100 people, 10 people will probably help cut you a check to pay for that technology that's so expensive, going back to the last question. Out of those 100 people who respond, probably 50 people will have a meeting with you and they will give you advice. Some of them will become mentors. And so, you know, folks in this time, you can't be looking at just building one company, one product, one solution, just by yourself. You need a community of people to help you build that piece of technology, that business, and you have to be driven and relentless in understanding it's a numbers game. You can't put, you know, Michael Jordan never took just one shot in his career. In fact, Michael Jordan, you know, got kicked off of his junior varsity high school team. And Michael Jordan also lost many game winning shots. However, we remember Michael Jordan for the icon that he is because he never stopped even in the face of adversity. And so that, that's the best piece of advice I can give folks is that as long as you put in the effort and you reach out to more and more people, the solutions, the connections, the money, the financing, the vision, the culture, the talent, it's there, but you can't sit in your own little happy box. Woe is me about this stuff. You really have to get out there because everybody's struggling. There is not a person right now in this world that isn't struggling one way, shape or form. And that's, this is a very unique time in human history. So I wish you all the very best and thank you for the question and thank you for the time. Thank you to Gary for your insights. One minute, Eben. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so let me repeat what I have said uh, somewhere in the past that um, not long ago, I mean, there was a question that was asked in the, um, um, there were multiple choice questions and the answers, three answers were, the question was, who has brought innovation or has changed or brought digitalization to your institution? The first option was your CFO, the second was your CTO or your CIO, and the third one was COVID-19. The answer was COVID-19. So what am I saying? That, I mean, whether you like it or not, if you decide not to innovate, if you decide not to incorporate technology in whatever you do, something else will push you to do that. Because you wouldn't want to become like a Kodak or a Nokia in the past and all that. You would want to move forward. And so specifically, I mean, picking out banking, I mean, it is very important. And I want to say this, that the fintechs that are there, banks should not see them as competition. They should see them as an advantage. The reality is that many banks are already collaborating with these third-party firms. You know, so it's funny that when they see them, 
They are thinking that, hey, these guys are going to affect their bottom line. They should see them as an advantage and not a competition. Collaborate with them. Take advantage and leverage well to deliver seamless services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eben. Um, Ashley, just a minute. How technology should be looked at now and in the future? Sure. Um, we, we see Africa being the last frontier. Um, so if you compare Africa to any part of the world, um, Africa is poised for more growth. And as such, we have our uniqueness and we have our innovation or our ideas and different things that will appeal to the African market as we grow and as the continent develops. So we believe it's important for organizations and um, the government agencies to invest in talent, invest in local talent in terms of technology as funding can unlock talent, it can unlock profit and also impact um, our communities. So we believe that the African story needs to be written by us um, and technology can help us in terms of growing um, um, that lasting economic um, impact. So that's my two pence. Okay, Hello. that's conclusion. Um, I will now move to Richard. Richard, your final words in one minute. Yeah, I believe that uh, most of the examples that we made, you know, um, 20 years ago, India invested in a lot of talent. Today, you know, most of the top companies are headed by Indians. Um, the Chinese are doing very well now. Um, I think that the next frontier is going to be Africa. And, you know, we need to invest in, tech, uh, in talent um so that at least we can rise you know we can rise digitally and um be able to sit down and you know fix most of um, the problems that we have and be able to even take on um some of the you know the other problems in that are in, in other parts of the world wonderful thank you very much the last but not the least um steve your final words on Technology, Wait, pressure. innovation pressure. in critical times. Thank you very much. I, I, I would just sum it up very quickly by saying FUBU. For us, by us, with our international partners. Africa will not transform itself on its own, but we need to put our capital ideas, investment, human capital on the continent with the support of everybody. And we should do it, I would say, the Chinese or the, uh, the Emirati or the uh, Arab, Arab way. We help them support us to execute whatever we want to do. For us, by us, with partners. Basically, I would want to see a real Wakanda happening in Africa. I'll stop there because time is up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, our panelists, Gary, Ashley, Steve, Aben, and Richard. It has been another insightful session with this um, Finance Investment Summit. We thank you for your time, and we thank you for your insight that you've shared. One key thing that we are all picking from today's discussion is that technology is the future. So it's either businesses innovate with the times or they extinguish with time. And I believe that we have all learned a few things from our, our distinguished speakers. At this point, I want to say thank you for joining us and I'll hand over to Gifty to give us the closing remarks. All right, thank you very much, Patrick. That was an amazing work you have done right there. Incredible, remarkable delivery. All our speakers were great, great, great. And I'm excited. Personally, I learned a lot, and I know that all participants, wherever you are, you have also learned so much.